Welcome to Vinnie Politan Investigates. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott filling in for Vinnie Politan. When someone in this country signs up to be a police officer, they take a very serious oath. They become responsible for upholding the law. To serve means to fight injustice and protect those who are vulnerable. And one officer in Stoughton, Massachusetts, is accused of doing the exact opposite. Authorities allege he used his badge as a way to manipulate, abuse, and eventually murder an innocent young woman by the name of Sandra Birchmore. This is her story. 23-year-old Sandra Birchmore was three months pregnant when she was found dead inside her Canton, Massachusetts apartment in February of 2021. Sandra's death was ruled a suicide, but people had questions, including her family. They filed a lawsuit against three Stoughton police officers alleging Sandra was groomed, sexually abused, and that her suicide may have been staged. Then, in 2024, renowned forensic pathologist Michael Baden came out saying he believes Sandra's death was a homicide. Now, one of the officers, 38-year-old Matthew Farwell, has been indicted on charges that he killed Sandra Birchmore and staged her suicide to hide her pregnancy and their secret relationship, which started when she was just 15. One of the most damning pieces of evidence against Farwell is surveillance video. Now, this was taken at Birchmore's apartment complex. The video captured several moments of February 1st, 2021, the day authorities believe Farwell murdered Sandra Birchmore. First, it appears Farwell and Birchmore have a brief conversation before she heads up to her apartment. About 30 minutes later, we see Birchmore leave the complex. A few minutes go by and she returns from outside where a blizzard, there you see her returning from outside where a blizzard is just beginning. After that, about four hours later, we see a figure entering the apartment. A man, there he is, that investigators believe is Matthew Farwell. He wipes off his feet, steps onto the elevator, and about 20 minutes later, he is captured leaving the apartment. And in this brief 20 minute window is when Farwell is alleged to have killed Sandra, strangling her to death in her own apartment. This brings me to my first question. What would be Matthew Farwell's motive let me bring in our special guest to join the discussion, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist associate professor at Pepperdine University and author of the book, The New Rules of Attachment, Dr. Judy Ho is with us. Also joining us, creator of the Justice for Sandra Birchmore Facebook page, Melissa Berry. Now, in a press conference announcing the charges against Matthew Farwell, U.S. Attorney Joshua Levy outlined the complete story of Farwell's relationship with Sandra Birchmore, giving great insight as to why he would murder Birchmore in cold blood. Let's watch. Back in 2010, a 12-year-old Sandra Birchmore applied to join the Stoughton Police Department's Explorers Program, which introduces teens to policing. Officer Matthew Farwell was an instructor in that program. And as alleged in court documents, he befriended Sandra Birchmore, contacted her on, online, went to the library with her, became friends on Facebook, essentially groomed her. And then he committed statutory rape by having sex with her when he was a 27-year-old police officer and she was just 15 years old. Mr. Farwell continued to have a sexual relationship with Sandra Birchmore until her death eight years later, allegedly meeting her for sex regularly when he was on duty and being paid by the Stoughton Police Department. Now, in the weeks leading up to Sandra Birchmore's death in February 2021, she found out that she was expecting a baby. And she told Mr. Farwell that he was the father. According to court documents, Ms. Birchmore was very excited about becoming a mother, buying baby clothes and other items, taking precautions to ensure the health of her new child. Santa Birchmore had good friends, she had a good job, she had dreams of becoming a nurse, and she had a child on the way. But Mr. Farwell did not share in that excitement. It's alleged that Mr. Farwell reacted quite negatively to the news that Santa Birchmore was pregnant with his child. And he acted angrily, it is alleged, when Santa Birchmore started making requests of Mr. Farwell 
around doctor's appointments and ultrasounds and what information would be on the birth certificate. Mr. Farwell was losing control in late 2020, early 2021. And the information that Sandra Birchmore possessed about his illegal conduct was in danger of slipping out. In fact, word started to get out about their relationship. Less than two weeks before she was found dead, someone called the Stoughton Police Department and disclosed that Matthew Farwell had had a relationship with Sandra Birchmore. And when Mr. Farwell learned about that, that call, he became visibly angry. Mr. Farwell, it is alleged in these court papers, started to lose his patience, lose his temper, and the six foot four inch Mr. Farwell started to be physically violent with four foot 10 inch Sandra Birchmore. And Sandra Birchmore told her friends that Mr. Farwell had pushed her and shoved her and put her in a chokehold. She was scared. And during that same time, Mr. Farwell was allegedly planning Sandra Birchmore's murder. For the first time, he requested a key to her apartment. And she told friends that he was oddly inspecting the apartment and looking at the closet, including the closet that she was found dead in front of. And then it all came to a head on February 1st, 2021. Mr. Farwell went over to her apartment that evening and he strangled Santa Birchmore to death. That's the allegation in this case. And he used his knowledge and experience as a law enforcement officer to stage her death to look like a suicide. All right, let's bring in our guests, Dr. Judy Ho and Melissa Berry. Melissa, let me start with you because I know that you started the Facebook page about this very case, ruled a suicide initially, but for the family, because they got Dr. Bodden involved, who said, no, this was not a suicide. Tell me more about what you know about this case. Um, from the second I saw the news drop on um, the local news uh, Boston station, I knew that there was more to the story and that Sandra probably didn't kill herself. And I started digging into the case and kept finding more and more that led me to believe that she was murdered. Um, so we have been trying to create a groundswell to get her case out in front of the public because a lot of people didn't know about Sandra's case. Even locals in the town of Stoughton didn't even know about um, Sandra's case. So we were just trying to push her case out there so the public can learn about what happened to her. And the more you learn, the more disturbing it is. Today, the team was literally reading through all of the information and in court documents. And the more we read, Dr. Ho, the more disturbing the allegations are because it's one thing on top of the next. It's not only he's accused of murdering a young lady in her 20s, but also that he started grooming her when she joined this program at 12, that he allegedly first had sex with her at 15. Help us understand any of this if we can. Well, definitely, Judge Ashley. You know, this is so sad because apparently, if all of the allegations are true, this is a person who has a very long history of planning and plotting having sex with a person who is under the age of 18 and making sure that she would stay committed to him and do as he says. Because what happens in this early age is you respect the adults around you. You expect them to tell you what to do and to have your best interests at heart. And those types of relational interactions stay with you even when you're an adult. So even though she's an adult at the time of her death, it's probably very, very believable that the entire time he's the person that has the power in the relationship because that's what he established from the very beginning. And she may stay with him and make excuses for him, even though there's bad behaviors, there's warning signs, because again, she became acquainted with him at a time when she was so susceptible to the influences of whatever he was trying to do to get her in his good graces. Yeah, and there are allegations that he was very controlling, that he was violent, that there were all kinds of things that he was doing against her. Again, she started as a victim, then became an adult. All right, ladies, through the court documents, we learned another disturbing detail about this alleged murder, particularly the timing 
of Farwell allegedly committing this horrific act. Within <clears throat> approximately 13 hours of his visit to the Birchmore apartment on February 1st of 2021, listen to this, his wife gave birth to their third child at Newton Wesley Hospital, adding to the intensifying pressure to ensure that Birchmore would not disclose information regarding his conduct. Dr. Ho, let me bring you back in. Talk about that piece of it because it sure does make it sound like he had a motive to have committed or allegedly he committed this murder. That's exactly right, Judge. What we're seeing here is that there was a pressure cooker, right? So not only was there rulers now that they've had this relationship, this relationship is illicit for a number of different reasons because he groomed her from a early age, allegedly. And then, of course, he's married. He has his own family. His third child was on the way. And if this got out, it wouldn't just mean his career. It would mean his reputation. It would mean his family life. What would the rest of his children and extended relatives think? So I can imagine that if the allegations were true, this is essentially, sadly, the perfect storm where there was so much external pressure. And maybe he was thinking, well, there could be a way out of this. Maybe there's a way. And then one day, it's like he just snapped and said, I don't see any way out except to eliminate her. Oh, Melissa, how has the Facebook community, the family, the friends, how have they reacted to the fact this is a police officer. And there were allegations that and, and evidence I would suggest in documents we saw that he was actually having sex with her in his police car while he was on duty. What's the reaction to this? Um, we're all in shock and horror. We're, um, we're just aghast of the details that are coming out in the documents. It's, it's disgusting what was done to Sandra. I knew a lot of it, but the stuff I'm finding out is it's so much more gruesome and, and twisted. And um, her family is happy that he is finally behind bars. Um, but there are also two other officers who were in on the grooming of Sandra. So hopefully those two men get charged with the grooming and abuse of Sandra also. Um, but the friends and family that I've spoken to are happy that this man is now charged with her murder. Yeah, gruesome and disgusting. Absolutely agree with you. And I appreciate, Melissa, that you shine a light and that you are advocating in the way that you are. A big thank you to you for not only joining us, but also continuing to work hard on this tragic case. Now, unfortunately, we do have to squeeze in a quick break, but please do not go anywhere. Dr. Judy Ho will be staying with us as we investigate our next question. Were there any red flags? Simply put, this case is about seeking justice for Sandra, who we believe was killed by Matthew Farwell after he allegedly groomed and sexually abused her when she was just 15 years old, violating her body and her civil rights. It's also about keeping Mr. Farwell from getting away with murder and from harming anyone else. Did you know that in middle income communities, there are about 13 books for every child? But in some underserved communities, there's only one book for every 300 children. Studies show that having lots of books at home is one of the best ways to help a child succeed in school and beyond. That's why the Scripps Howard Fund started the If You Give a Child a Book campaign to give books to children who need them most, like me. So please, if you could give a child a book today, just scan the QR code. We would be so grateful. Simply put, this case is about seeking justice for Sandra, who we believe was killed by Matthew Farwell after he allegedly groomed and sexually abused her when she was just 15 years old, violating her body and her civil rights. It's also about keeping Mr. Farwell from getting away with murder and from harming anyone else. We in law enforcement are entrusted with immense authority because our decisions can have life-changing consequences, both good and bad. To temper that power, we must adhere to the highest of ethical standards. What we believe Officer Matthew Farwell did, as outlined in today's indictment, is depraved and a gross betrayal of his sworn oath and the public's trust. Let me be clear, Matthew Farwell's gun and badge did not grant him authority to violate the Constitution. And it certainly didn't entitle him to sexually exploit, abuse and rape a child before killing her and her unborn baby in an attempt to cover up his alleged crimes. Matthew Farwell's badge did not grant him authority to violate the Constitution. 
and it certainly didn't entitle him to sexually exploit, abuse, and rape a child. Wise words from the assistant special agent in charge of Boston's FBI unit. So how did Matthew Farwell begin this abuse in the first place? New court documents claim to provide the answer to that very question. Let's take a look together. As early as 2012, he began communicating with Birchmore online, including befriending her on Facebook. At the time, he was 26 years old. She was just 15. While using the internet to lay the groundwork for his child sexual exploitation, Farwell would also meet Birchmore at the Stoughton Public Library, where he would sexually groom her under the guise of providing academic tutoring. Ultimately, he engaged in sex acts with Birchmore, violating the Massachusetts statutory rape law by having sexual intercourse with her in 2013, when she was just 15. This leads me to question number two. The alleged abuse started when Sandra Birchmore was only 13 years old. Abuse, Farwell allegedly continued for over a decade. So the question is, were there any red flags? To help answer that question, let's bring in our guest, still with me, clinical forensic neuropsychologist, Dr. Judy Ho. And now joining us, retired first justice of the Worcester County Juvenile Court, Judge Carol Erskine is with us. Thank you both for being here. All right, let's lead with the obvious question. Juvenile Court, Judge Erskine, you're familiar with the things that you can see unfortunately happen to children. How does this happen? How does this start? Is there anything that you look at at the perpetrator and say, this is why? It's very hard to um, take a look at what the red flags are in a case like this, just because she was under the, the control of this, uh, of course, of the police officer right from the beginning. But I've seen, sadly, many cases of sexual exploitation. Runaways are an everyday event in the juvenile court. And some of these kids that come in are uh, sexually exploited. And a lot of the things that were just mentioned in the indictment about online connections, especially when um, kids are online and there's no one monitoring it. In this case, it's particularly difficult because she had losses in her life. I know her mother and grandmother died. They were raising her. They died when she was a teen. So you don't have a lot of the usual controls that are existing with kids where you have adults that might be watching what they're doing online or paying attention to it. So the red flags that are oftentimes there that we might see in juvenile court with parents or other people in intervening just weren't there, even though he was engaging in a lot of the same kind of tactics. Um, I've had cases of kids who were, who were contacted online met at the library um, and just uh, this beginning of uh, grooming leading to ultimately to sex. This, is, this case is a bit different in that respect because I don't think the controls that are often there with kids who are sexually um, exploited were there in this case. She was extremely vulnerable and I don't think there were a lot of controls given the losses that she had in her life. Yeah, and I would say one of the things that cuts against the red flags is the fact he was a police officer. And Dr. Ho, what this says to me is a reminder, if you're in the field like all of us are, you know this, but anybody can be an alleged perpetrator, even, and, and sometimes it's because they're in a position of trust and power and authority, and they can use that to their advantage to groom. That's absolutely right, Judge Ashley. And what we see here is that Officer Farwell had a, a great basis for being able to be that trusted individual right away. Police officer was teaching in the program that she volunteered in starting at the age of 12. Just as Judge Erskine just pointed out, she had losses in her life, not the usual parental oversight. And oftentimes for perpetrator, that's their in. They're looking for people like this who are vulnerable because they're looking for support and love and attention and a trusted adult in their life because they don't have that person in their life 
for whatever reason. And they're saying, let me fill that void for you. Let me be like a father figure for you. You're having trouble in school and no one's helping you with homework. Let me be your tutor. Let me meet you at the library and do all of this for you. And so that's how they start to build this trust over time by providing this way to support them in a time when they're already feeling maybe a little lost and a little bit more vulnerable than the average person. You don't usually hear about perpetrators successfully being able to infiltrate someone who's got parents that are hovering around, they're actively involved, their relationship with their child is good, it's intact. You don't hear that quite as much and there's a reason for that. Perpetrators are targeting individuals like this and exploiting their vulnerabilities. They are targeting. Judge Erskine, let me ask you to comment also on the fact that this is a situation in which maybe somebody did see something. Maybe there were red flags. Maybe somebody saw him get too close to her in the library and it seemed like it was a little awkward or uncomfortable. Perhaps somebody actually witnessed him having sex in his police car and said, wow, she looks pretty young. I do think some of those red flags existed, but it may be that people weren't comfortable coming forward. Well, I think that's the point. I mean, even people that she was texting as she got older who kind of knew about the relationship, really interesting <clears throat> to me is that you know, every, everyone, the people that were around her understood that the people that that were exploiting her or this exploitation by the detective, um, they're, they're police officers. I mean, people are generally cons very concerned about uh, making reports. And, and as the indictment shows, when the report was um, actually made and it was contact to a dispatcher, he then started intimidating the dispatcher. So every blockade that could have existed for her did. did exist. Yep. It All right, and I apologize, we're out of time. A huge thank you to Dr. Judy Ho and Judge Carol Erskine for their valuable insight. I'm Judge Ashley filling in for Vinnie Politan. This is Vinnie Politan Investigates. Welcome to Vinnie Politan Investigates. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott filling in for Vinnie Politan. Tonight we are investigating the tragic case of Sandra Birchmore. She was a young Massachusetts woman who always thought highly of those in law enforcement. In fact, at the age of 12, she signed up for her town's youth program. She wanted to meet the officers and learn about what police do. And from that day on, authorities allege that Birchmore began a horrific path, ultimately leading to her demise. It is alleged that she was groomed, sexually abused, and eventually murdered by the very officers she idolized. This is her story. Sandra Birchmore was three months pregnant when she was found dead inside her Canton, Massachusetts apartment in February of 2021. Sandra's death was ruled a suicide, but people had questions, including her family. They filed a lawsuit against three Stoughton police officers alleging Sandra was groomed, sexually abused, and that her suicide may have been staged. Now, one of the officers, 38-year-old Matthew Farwell, has been indicted on charges that he killed Sandra Birchmore and staged staged her suicide to hide her pregnancy and their secret relationship, which started when she was just 15. Through the court documents, we have learned a very interesting aspect of this case. It is alleged by authorities that Birchmore's pregnancy was part of Farwell's motive for killing her, but this pregnancy appears to be no accident. Take a look. Birchmore presented Farwell with an ultimatum. Farwell would have to agree to engage in unprotected sex with Birchmore with the goal of conceiving a child. In return, Birchmore would not disclose their relationship. Sandra Birchmore used their illegal relationship as leverage to convince Farwell to impregnate her. And Farwell agreed in an attempt to avoid her from speaking out about their past sexual activity. These are some very unusual dynamics for the pair, even by court TV standards, which brings me to my next question. What was the nature of their relationship? 
To break all this down, let's bring in our experts. Joining us, retired First Justice of the Worcester County Juvenile Court, Judge Carol Erskine is with us. Also joining us, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, associate professor at Pepperdine University, and author of the book, The New Rules of Attachment, Dr. Judy Ho is with us. Dr. Ho, let me start with you because as I learned this information and was reading through court documents, all I could think was, it sounds like a young lady who is making an informed adult decision that she wants to have a child with this man, even if on her own, versus a young girl who was groomed, sexually assaulted, and raped by this man at the age of 15. Well, oftentimes, Judge Ashley, people don't recognize that what they went through is a form of sexual trauma. And in a way to try to take power back on their situation, they will sometimes assert their needs in a different way. Oftentimes, the trauma victims I've worked with, sometimes it takes them decades to realize, wow, this was wrong. And in fact, that was child abuse. Because once they admit that to themselves, then sometimes they have to think about themselves as a victim and they don't want to do that. And I think, of course, we don't know because we can't talk to Birchmore anymore. But what we do know is that she was trying to probably assert some part of her own will on this relationship. He was probably so secretive from the start. He has a wife, he has his own family. So everything was secretive. And she's saying, if, if we're gonna keep this up and if you want sex from me and that's the transactional nature of our relationship, then you need to do something for me so that it's actually transactional. And the thing that she could hold over his head is you had sex with me when I was a minor. And even if I don't consider that child abuse in my head, I know it's wrong and I know you can be prosecuted for it. Judge, let's add a little additional information to this before you weigh in. When Sandra Birchmore first discovered she was pregnant, she sent a text to Matthew Farwell letting him know. She texted him a photo of a poster she had made celebrating their conception. The poster reads, congrats, we are going to be parents. In court documents, authorities <coughs> described Farwell's reaction, and here is what they said. Farwell's immediate response to Birchmore's disclosure about the pregnancy was, I literally have nothing to say right now. How could you express that in text when I said I don't appreciate it? All right, now, Judge Erskine, if you would weigh in, now that we know that additional information, she seems excited, we're going to be parents. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. Right, I think the nature of the relationship, especially given that information, is it's very much akin to a domestic violence relationship. Yes, she was groomed and sexually exploited, but at, at some point, you know, she viewed herself as a partner with him, that she loved him, she believed he loved her. How is that different than any severe domestic violence relationship? And not only that, every single factor that you will see in a domestic violence relationship uh, regarding where there's coercive control was existing here. He controlled where she went, he controlled who she saw, he tracked her movements. And like other severe domestic violence relationships, the continuum continued. He became aggressive, he was assaultive, he was punitive with sexual violence. Every single factor um, related to coercive control that you see in domestic violence relationships was happening here as she got older. And just like in a domestic violence relationship where a person starts to assert some control when they're living together and they say, I'm going to leave, that's when things escalate to lethality. And in this case, they weren't living together, but she was starting to assert control, finally saying, you know what? I'm gonna have a baby, we're gonna be parents. And that led to lethality. And it's, it's so much akin to a domestic violence relationship in every aspect that you have to look at it, in my view, through that lens and not just through the lens of sexual exploitation. So well said. And she may have been getting what she wanted, which was being pregnant, having a child, only to result in her murder. The court documents also outline some more Farwell's texts to Birchmore. Farwell asked Birchmore, what would you have done if we never used a condom and I never pulled out? Birchmore reassured Farwell that she would have still finished school, smiley face. Birchwell then told Farwell, I loved prom night. It was worth not going to prom. 
Dr. Ho, again, you know, she's so young and so, I think, sounding like she's in love with this man, and he just continues to take advantage and victimize her. She met him at a time where her identity was just forming. She was learning about who she was. She was having all of these important milestones. She's talking about prom. I think that makes you realize the mindset that she's in, right? Reflecting back on that as a very important event in her life and, and how much she enjoyed that and then saying, hey, it's okay because all of this worth worth it even if I missed a specific milestone. But the fact that prom is a milestone for her that she still talks about shows you how young she is and how much life she still had to live. And this, for all intents and purposes, was the man of her life, the love of her life. And she didn't know any better. I hear that all the time from patients who have been through various forms of trauma-based relationships. It's like, well, that was my only template. I didn't even know that that was abuse. I didn't know that coercion was abuse. I thought that was how he loved me. And so I wonder how much of that also played a role. That's a great point. They can't know any better because of all those things you just described. Another series of text messages Messages between the pair revealed some shocking sexual preferences held by Farwell. On June 15, 2019, Farwell and Birchmore exchanged text messages in which they discussed role playing during their next sexual encounter. Farwell asked Birchmore how old she was going to pretend to be during that encounter. When Birchmore responded 14, Farwell replied with a smiley face emoji. In another conversation between Farwell and Birchmore on February 21st to 2020, Farwell describes pinning Birchmore down during sex and asks her, will you say, Matt, stop, I'm 13, I'm not ready for this, OMFG, please stop? Judge, 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 I know the line of work that you're in, you've seen these things, you've heard these things, but it is so unimaginable as you hear this, that this is what's unfolding and that he's saying these things to her. Yeah, I mean, it's so clear that his purposes were for children. I mean, in the text about him taking her virginity at 15, I think he says something like, you know, oh, I, I, wish, it had, I wish it had been sooner. So, you know, this is a case that has so many aspects to it and his uh, proclivity for not only um, sex with someone very young, but for violent sex. And truthfully, whether she agreed to it or not, as you see in the text messages, he carried that out anyway. It was very clear from the indictment that little things that she would do, like she, she got bad grades and that and that what ha what happened as a result of that is that he would punish her with violent sex. So he was going to engage in violent sex one way or the other, whether she agreed to it and it was part of, part of some fantasy that he described to her or whether he was going to make up some excuse to punish her with extreme sexual violence. Uh, I mean, it's 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 just a it, it's it's a horrific case that, you know, had every factor uh, relative to impending lethality, and that's exactly what happened. It's, it's just a tragedy. It is, and if the allegations are true, it's sadistic and sad. Let's quickly take a look, though, at some more of Farwell's alleged sexual preferences revealed in court documents. On several occasions, Farwell sent Birchmore text messages directing her to act as if she were being raped during the ensuing encounter. He also had Birchmore join a sexual role play in which he posed as her older brother and simulated non-consensual incest. Just quickly, Dr. Ho, this takes it to a whole nother level because now you've added incest and role playing and rape. Is this typical of somebody who exploits kids for sexual abuse? Well, I think this is somebody who's being very honest about his internal monologue as he's doing the exploitation. And notice that it's not enough for him, right? So now she has to pretend she's a 13-year-old rather than the age that she was when they had sex, which is around the age of 15. Now it's, this is an incest situation. This is a rape and violence situation, as Judge Erskine already pointed out. This is showing his inner sexual proclivities. And sometimes people aren't this honest and outright, but I think he knew he had enough control over her that he could say that to her and she would essentially bend to his every wish. Yeah, I think you're right. A big thank you to Dr. Judy Ho for 
joining us tonight. We know how valuable your time is. It's greatly appreciated. Judge Erskine will be sticking with us as we investigate our final question of the evening. Who else was involved? It is disheartening to have to charge law enforcement officers, especially with crimes as serious. But it's our job at the Department of Justice to investigate potential crimes without fear and without favor. One of the most successful true crime TV shows ever. This is crazy. Now has a new home on America's original true crime obsession. 48 Hours on Court TV. Coming up next on Court TV. Join me for a Court TV true crime series where we take you from the crime scene to the courtroom in America's most compelling cases. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. New season premieres September 8th. Only on Court TV. It is disheartening to have to charge law enforcement officers, especially with crimes as serious. But it's our job at the Department of Justice to investigate potential crimes without fear and without favor. We do in this office what we've been doing for decades with our federal partners like the FBI. We follow the facts regardless of where they lead. We apply the law and the principles of federal prosecution, full stop. We are not influenced by social media chatter. We are not influenced by politics. We're influ influenced by the facts and the law. Our mission is to do our level best to do justice in every case. And our mission today is to do justice for Santa Birchmore. That was U.S. Attorney Joshua Levy at a press conference announcing Farwell's charges. He was making a very important point, how disheartening it is to have to charge someone in law enforcement with such heinous crimes, but how important it is to hold them accountable just like everybody else. Now, in the months leading up to Sandra's murder, she began speaking with friends about her relationship with Farwell. Just a few weeks before her death, one of her friends, now this is referred to as person two in court documents, actually called the Stoughton Police Department to report Farwell's past illegal behavior. Take a look. On January 20th, 2021, person two called the Stoughton Police Department and in that call referenced the sexual relationship between Birchmore and Farwell. During this investigation, I have interviewed person five, an employee of the Stoughton Police Department, who received the call from person two on January 20th of 2021. Person five indicated that he, she took down person number two's name and information and gave it to Farwell. Person five indicated that Farwell immediately got angry and pissed off and ordered person five not to speak about this to anyone and to never talk about it again. Stoughton police knew about this illegal relationship. Yet two weeks later, Farwell was able to allegedly murder Sandra and wasn't charged for the crime for another three years. This brings me to the final question of the night. Who else was involved? Still with me, retired First Justice of the Worcester County Juvenile Court, Judge Carol Erskine, and now joining us, retired police commander and host of Profiling Evil, Mike King. Mike, let me start with you because what a great example of profiling evil, talking about this man. And what about that person number five who worked at the police department and chose to take the information and take it directly to Farwell? Yeah, I, th I think what we're going to see, Judge, is some uh, collateral damage as a result of this, whether it was people trying to cover up, people making a really bad judgment call. Uh, but, but how do you go past information like this and just pass it on and say to somebody, hey, they're talking about this. I really appreciated the later response of the police chief who stepped up and said, we're going to investigate this. We're going to do it at 100 percent. But but I think we're going to see other police officers who may have had information or may have passed things along, hopefully not knowing quite what to do with it. But holy cow, they've spent a career in law enforcement. We know what to do with criminal cases. You move criminal cases forward. You don't just pass on the information and hope it goes away. Uh, so well said. Hindsight's 2020, Judge, but 
theoretically, if that person five had not given the information to Farwell, but instead reported it to HR, up the chain of command, whatever way was appropriate, might that have prevented the murder, alleged murder by this defendant of her? And we may be having some technical difficulties, Judge. I'm not able to hear you. Let's try now. All right, still not able to hear you. Let me bring in some other information because there's so many details we wanna share with you. One of those other disturbing details came from an internal investigation into the Stoughton police. Matthew Farwell's twin brother, Officer William Farwell, allegedly also had an inappropriate relationship with Birchmore. According to the investigation, William Farwell exchanged explicit messages and images with Birchmore while he was on duty. And there was a third man alleged to have had an inappropriate relationship with Birchmore, Robert Devine. He was the man in charge of the youth mentor program Birchmore was involved in. Here is Devine pictured with Birchmore as a teenager in the program prior to being interviewed as a part of the internal investigation. Both men resigned from the force. Uh, Mike, honestly, uh, how can you even imagine that it goes this deep that now allegedly a twin brother on the force, another officer on the force, it's almost like they're passing her around. It, it's really uh, disgusting. Yes, if, if all of these allegations are true, Judge, this is so predatory and passing it around, I, I think is probably the best description because this child wasn't in a position to make decisions. These were people who were in a position of trust, not only as mentors and, and leaders within the organization at, at that level, and in one case, they become a leader of the organization at a much higher level, but, but these are individuals who absolutely were in a position that they could have stopped things early on and managed this thing as it was coming a, a, a about. And, and these are the, some of the fearful things, in, in my opinion, when we have unsupervised um, programs within organizations where adults, and, and in this case, sometimes only one adult, have a position of authority and trust over somebody else and they can easily manipulate them and we see these kinds of things happen it is this this whole thing is not only disgusting it is incredibly heartbreaking it is so heartbreaking and this one is really an onion some of the cases are but as we peel back layers and look at the documents it just continues to get more and more depraved here's what u.s attorney joshua levy said at a press conference when asked about other possible suspects in this case I'm not going to comment on, on information that's not in the public record. As, uh, as you heard, this is an ongoing matter, so we're going to continue to look at look into this matter. Um, and if there's other individuals um, that we develop evidence that they've violated the federal law, we'll, we'll proceed. All right, so Mike, come back in and talk to us about that. I mean, they're saying all the right things. It's, and this, to your point earlier, is when you are grateful you being everyone involved and watching that they are taking this so seriously and i don't think they're going to leave any stone unturned to figure out who all was involved or might be criminally responsible no and i i, I think that, you know it was such a critical time right now where law enforcement is really under a microscope for the kinds of behaviors that are going on in some organizations and and sadly we're picking out those a uh, small handful of officers who are really making poor choices, criminal choices in some cases. And we're, we're, it's, I think, impacting the entire profession and, and creating this level of distrust in the organization when my experience would say that's absolutely not the case. The majority are hardworking, honest police officers that are trying to pull these cases together. Like like we talked about, Judge, the, the chief of police stepped up demanded an investigation, brought in other agencies to, to help in this thing. We're seeing 
as this thing progresses that officers are stepping up and voluntarily surrendering their commission. Uh, they're being thrown out of post and, and the police officer standards are pulling them. So we're seeing things happen, but it's not fast enough. That's right. A few bad apples. All right. A special thank you to my guests, Mike King and Judge Carol Erskine. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott in for Vinnie Politan. Thank you for watching Vinnie Politan Investigates. We'll keep digging for answers as the investigation continues.